doing here. My name is Dr. Naftali Serrano. I am the executive director of the Collaborative Family Healthcare Association. And uh, most of you know who we are, but if you don't, uh, our mission is really to make integrated care the standard of care nationally. We bring together um, the worlds of medicine and behavioral health. Um, much of our work, as you'll hear today uh, with our presenters, is centered in the area of primary care. Uh, there are all sorts of ways in which we express our mission and webinars is are, are one of them. So um, if you visit our webinar page on our website, cfha.net, under the, under the Learn and Network tab, uh, you will see our uh, webinar series. Uh, they're, they're usually cutting edge topics, things that folks are actually working on the ground, as you'll hear today. Um, so uh, keep, keep an eye out for that. Um, I would be remiss as well if I didn't also uh, mention our annual conference that's coming up in October, October 19th through the 21st, and it is set to uh, take place in Houston, Texas. Um, we have uh, over 400 and or close to 450 uh, conference attendees already uh, registered, so if you are interested in attending, definitely um, look up our conference website, integratedcareconference.com, um, and look there for more information, uh, particularly if you're looking at hotel rooms. Those are, are going to be probably running out uh, pretty soon. So take a look at integratedcareconference.com um, in our main website at cfha.net. So uh, just a couple of housekeeping items for today. Uh, we have here... Uh, our presentation and the, and the uh, presenters, but uh, we want this to be as interactive as we can. Uh, you all are in listen-only mode, which means you're not able to uh, uh, verbally talk. Um, if that time, when the time comes for some interaction at the end of the presentation, so the presenters will be talking for about 45 minutes, and then the last 15 minutes or so will be time for question and answer, uh, you may elect to uh, ask to be unmuted, or the preferred option is often just to actually put in, and actually it's not true that you put it in here in the questions. Um, that slide is wrong. You put it in the chat box um, on your sort of go to webinar control panel, and the chat box uh, is a place where you can type in as the presenters are talking a question. They will be collecting those and answering those uh, at the end. So I believe that's all the business that we have, which lets us get right to our presentation today. Um, I'm going to briefly just introduce who our folks are while I uh, give the screen to them. Let me just change them over now. All right. And so our presenters today are Ruth, uh, Drs. Ruth Nutting and uh, Amy Sear. Uh, in addition to Vanessa Loaf. Uh, Ruth is at uh, Via Christi Family Medicine uh, Residency. Um, Vanessa Loaf is out of Wichita State, Wichita State University, uh, an institute called the Community Engagement Institute. Um, that's part of the Center for Public Health Initiatives. And what's exciting about what they're going to talk to us about today is that this really is an emerging area in integrated care. Uh, where we begin to look at childhood trauma and use that as a lens to really understand our populations and potentially do some early intervention. So I'm really excited to hear what uh, they have to tell us today. Um, I hope you are too. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to our presenters. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. My colleagues and I are really excited to be sharing our experiences with implementing the Adverse Childhood Experiences Questionnaire. So we want to start out today with just introducing ourselves um, in a little bit more depth. So I am, uh, like Naftali mentioned, I'm Ruth Nutting, and I have been at Via Christi Health for just over a year. I started here last July, straight out of my postdoctoral fellowship uh, in behavioral health at the University of Nebraska Medic center where I was in internal medicine. So it's been a little bit of a shift into family medicine and it's been fun getting to work with children again. So at Via Christi Health, I have the responsibility of overseeing our behavioral health program that involves creating and instructing our behavioral health 
medicine curriculum to our 54 family medicine residents. I also get the opportunity to uh, create and implement wellness initiatives for our residents and then follow up with our residents throughout their three years of residency to make sure that they are feeling well overall and not experiencing high rates of burnout. I also get to oversee a pre-master's level behavioral health internship for two marriage and family therapy students who are interning here for one year as medical family therapists. I spend some time myself in the clinic, both doing integrated care, so brief consultations, as well as follow-up traditional sessions. And then in the remaining time, I spend working on research projects and initiatives such as this, as well as doing some admin. So that's myself. I'm Dr. Amy Seary. I am a fellow with the American Academy of Pediatrics. I am also an assistant professor with Department of Family and Community Medicine at KU School of Medicine. And one of my favorites, I'm faculty for a family medicine residency as a pediatrician, which is a lot of fun, actually. Uh, and this allows me to work with the 54 residents that Ruth mentioned uh, from the clinical perspective. I do inpatient and outpatient pediatric care. Hi there. My name is Vanessa Loaf. And as was said before, I am a project specialist with the Center for Public Health Initiatives at the Wichita State University Community Engagement Institute. There's a lot of words there. Um, part of my job is to work specifically with health departments and safety net clinics and other Medicaid-serving clinics to implement uh, and train their staff around trauma-informed care. But I also am the coordinator for our trauma-informed care initiatives throughout the institute. So we also work with school districts, uh, law enforcement, uh, health coalitions, lots of other sectors in the community around building trauma-informed systems. All right, so when we begin, Vanessa is going to provide a nice comprehensive overview of the ACEs sciences and trauma-informed care. Dr. Siri and I will follow that up with talking a little bit more about our patient population and the implementation process of the ACEQ. And then we'll be closing today with addressing both limitations as well as future directions for this pilot study. So we want to go ahead and recognize first that many of you may be familiar with adverse childhood experiences and with the science behind that, but we want to make sure that that's true for everyone. So we're going to give you a little bit of a foundation about why trauma-informed care matters and why uh, this clinic has chosen to take this on as a project. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about the different kinds of stress that we all experience as human beings. And first of all, there's positive stress, and that's a normal part of healthy development. For some people, that kind of stress can look like um, speaking in front of a group, it could be the jolt that we get when the car on the highway next to us gets a little bit too close. Um, but it can also be that good news kind of excitement when we get a new job or we get to see a good friend that we haven't seen in a long time. And those kinds of stressors give us brief increases in our heart rate. We see mild elevations in stress hormone levels. But typically, we're able to come back to a state of relaxation pretty quickly once that excitement has passed. And to borrow an analogy from Dr. Siri, some stress is needed when we're talking about bone structure. No stress means the bones don't grow well. And some stress is needed to build those strong, healthy bones. And the same thing is true when we're talking about building strong, healthy brains and bodies. So when we then start to talk about the next level of stress, which is tolerable stress, that kind of stress is a little more severe. And the exposure to elevator hormone levels can give us more negative effect, but it's usually buffered when there's a good support, strong supportive relationships in our lives. Then we get to toxic stress. And when we're talking about toxic stress, it, those Stressors are more persistent, they're stronger, and they cause a prolonged exposure to those elevated hormone levels, and they can cause permanent damage to a number of our systems, including the immunological system and our nervous systems. 
just being bathed all the time in those chemicals does actual physical structural damage to our internal body systems. So bringing that back to Dr. Siri's analogy, a bone that suffered a break but gives, gets really good follow-up treatment is likely going to heal relatively quickly. But if that bone is left unattended, we start to see breakdown and permanent damage where the bones can be uh, not be repaired as quickly then, if at all. So some of you or all of you maybe are may be familiar with the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, which was conducted in 1997 by Dr. Vincent Felady from the Kaiser Permanente HMO and Dr. Robert Anda from the CDC. And one of the things that they did in this uh, study with a little over 17,000 middle class folks that had insurance um, was to it was an obesity clinic where they did this, and it was to learn a little bit more about uh, how adverse childhood experiences impact lifelong chronic disease um, challenges that they may have. And so specifically, this study looked at 10 different experiences that uh, those folks may have had before the age of 18, and you'll see there that it's divided into essentially two categories, abuse and neglect and household defense dysfunction. And what they determined or what they learned during that course of time is that these 10 experiences had a significant impact on long-term health and well-being. Now, I want to point out that though that study 20 years ago focused on just these 10, we all know that the children and families that come into our clinics have seen way more than these 10 stressors. So for some families, it could be neighborhood violence. For others, it could be separation by death or deportation. For our friends in Texas and Florida, and even here in Kansas, it could be natural disaster. And so um, all of those kinds of things may be affecting their long-term health, but the study focused specifically on those 10. So, we then want to talk about what the impact has been, or what they learned the impact was from those 10 experiences. What they found was that children who have experienced at least one or more of these toxic events were at increased risk later in life for chronic diseases such as cancer, stroke, even arthritis, and others like COPD, suicide, depression, some of those things Suicide and depression, we all kind of say, that's normal. We expect people that have been through a lot of trauma to have that kind of thing. But what was shocking to folks was how that arthritis is on the list and kidney disease is on the list. And some of those immunological disorders can be directly tied back to that exposure. The other thing that's important to note is that it didn't matter which of those experiences they had. What did matter was how many. And so it was a dose-dependent response um, when we started looking at some of the more severe uh, chronic kinds of diseases. For folks that experienced six or more, so if you look at the 10 and they had six or more, they were either, even at increased risk of death 20 years earlier than their counterparts who may not have had those experiences or may not have had some additional support support to be able to mitigate those experiences. The other thing that I want to make really clear is, you know, we spoke just a minute ago about how the body gets washed in these chemicals, and over time that does permanent damage, but it's not just damage to the individual. It then becomes something that can be passed on from generation to generation as the, that genetic makeup is altered. Then we have moms having babies, and they continue. They, those stressors don't stop when they turn 18. So if that continues into adulthood and they don't have the appropriate interventions or supports, those kinds of that kind of damage can then be passed on to their children and becomes kind of an ongoing cycle that is way harder for us to intervene with later. So then we start talking about what do we do about that? 
And we use the, what we've learned in ACEs science to then start talking about what we call trauma-informed systems of care. And so using that groundbreaking information, we start talking to organizations, we talk about systems and communities even, that start to build policies and practices that use that trauma-informed lens that was mentioned earlier. And because we don't know who, by looking at me, you can't tell whether I've had one adverse childhood experience or 10. And often folks that have had those experiences, if they've had the right systems and supports in place, will never know. And so we can't guess that. And that's why we've taken this universal precaution approach to care delivery. We firmly believe that imp implementing systems and policies for everyone is the best way to mitigate those uh, consequences for folks that have experienced it, but also put us in a position to prevent those experiences from happening in the first place. So as we know, there's going to be a small amount of folks that we encounter that do need some sort of intervention or treatment. And that's where the, those additional supports in a clinic in particular, and um, Dr. Netting and Dr. Siri are going to talk about how that looks here. But that's where those particular um, supports come in. But not everybody needs that. Not everybody who has an A score of six needs that. But we all do need to be nurtured and cared for and looked after and have positive relationships in our lives. And that's what trauma-informed systems of care are about. So when we use the words trauma-informed, what we really mean are these four things. And this comes from the substance um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, lovingly known as SAMHSA, and this is how they describe being trauma-informed. First of all, the organization or system realizes the widespread impact of trauma. In that ACE study, more than two-thirds of folks had experienced at least one or more adverse childhood experience, but also realizes that there are potential paths for recovery. Then we recognize those signs and symptoms of trauma in not only our patients, but also the families that come in with them, their caretakers, and the people who are working in our clinics, and how those experiences shape how they respond to the work that they do or the people that they encounter. And then the organization responds by fully integrating that knowledge into their policies, procedures, and practices so that they can actively resist re-traumatization. So I'm going to pass things over now back to Dr. Nutting, and we're going to talk about what you were here to talk about, which is how this is going in this clinic. Thank you, Vanessa. That was a very important overview of trauma-informed care and ACEs that all of our listeners really needed to understand before we move forward and talk about the implementation process. So that was wonderful. So yeah, so now Dr. Siri and myself are going to talk to you more about the groundwork that has gone on um, in, in the implementation process. So as I mentioned during introductions, uh, I am a pediatrician working in a family medicine residency program. We're actually an extremely large one with 18 per year. So as Dr. Nutting uh, mentioned, a uh, total of 54. That's a lot of residents and a lot of patients to care for. Our residents do have their own private clinics that they have, but they also have the opportunity to come to what we call a specialty clinic. Uh, it is a facility where we can serve multiple needs from cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy, trauma follow-up, breast clinic, you name it. But we have a special little carved out space specifically for pediatric clinic. We are, uh, my, excuse me, myself, as well as the, my fellow pediatrician, Dr. Sarah Husseini, we have our own panel that we share and we allow residents to come over and render care with us. The panel that we have is what you might expect associated with a residency clinic. These are people who are on a lot of Medicaid, who have been dismissed from a lot of other clinics. But we also take care of some very medically complex patients, some that may be intimidating to general pediatricians who might have been a little longer out of their training. We get a lot of NICU graduates, et cetera. So that kind of just explains who we're serving. We're also taking care, as you would guess, of care of a population that can have limited resources and might be coming from the rougher parts of our city here in Wichita, Kansas. 
And with that, we know that even though we have multiple faces, from myself to a nurse practitioner to the residents, multiple faces of care providers that might be going in and seeing these families, that we still want to render high-class care, and we want these families to feel supported and nurtured. One of the issues we've had for years is that while we care and want to know about the problems families and patients are encountering, sometimes we're opening a huge can of worms, and we have a schedule to maintain. You're wanting to have a well child check, but next thing you know, you're talking about a sexual abuse incident that may have happened 12 years ago. But you're also wondering, did someone ever report this to Child Protective Services? I'm sure many of you can relate. So I was thrilled when Dr. Nutting approached me with this. As a clinician, yes, there are things that I want to know about, or at least the aspect of trauma in my patient's life. And I want my patients to know that they are welcome to have that conversation with me if they want. But we don't have to constantly reopen the trauma and the wounds that they've had by still providing reasonable care and getting them the services they need. So we'll talk a little bit more about how that happened. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sperry. So I want to talk a little bit about the behavioral health program that we have here. As Dr. Sperry had mentioned, our patients do have psychosocial stressors that need to be attended to within the clinical setting. We have a large patient population. and with numerous, numerous psychosocial needs. So when I started here just over a year ago, as I had mentioned previously, the behavioral health program was, was small. It was myself and another behavioral health provider. And I'd like to mention that we have two clinics, two main family medicine clinics. And so I was at one clinic, the other behavioral health provider was, was at the other clinic. I was doing both integrated care, so doing those brief, brief consultations while doing some traditional sessions as well. And then our other behavioral health provider was doing primarily traditional psychotherapy sessions. So when I joined Via Christi Health, I came in with a vision of expanding and integrating the behavioral health program. So I was given the tools necessary last year to come in and implement, a, like I mentioned, a pre-master's level behavioral health internship. That kicked off last May. So with two marriage and family therapy interns joining my team, we were able to expand the behavioral health program to 60% coverage within our clinic. So that's both integrated care coverage as well as traditional psychotherapy sessions. So with, the, with having more behavioral health providers, we were able to do more in the clinic, and that's when I first had the conversations with Dr. Seary about expanding into the pediatrics clinic because until that time, behavioral health had never played a, a role within that specialty clinic. So I approached Dr. Seary back in June about moving into that as well as doing those brief consultations. And it was at that time that I uh, also talked to Dr. Seary about implementing the ACEQ. So I want to go back uh, and give you a little information on why I became invested in trauma-informed care and the ACEQ. So it was actually last February that I attended a community workshop put on by Vanessa herself uh, and another provider in the area. And the workshop was on trauma-informed systems of care. And this approach, it just clicked. I had a thousand light bulbs go on in my head that day. And I was like, as a family medicine residency, we need to embrace trauma-informed care. And I was on fire for trauma-informed care. I came back, I talked to our leaders about it, and Vanessa so politely came in May and talked to our program director, our director of graduate medical education, and a couple of our clinical managers to talk to them about this approach and why it was so important for our residents to understand and embrace it with the patient population that we serve. So in the very beginning, I got our leaders on board, and our first initiative was to have NESA help me train our residents. So we have three months that we're dedicating to trauma-informed care, which is really exciting. But at that time, when I started to work more with Dr. Siri in the, in the pediatric clinic, I wanted to also do more, and I wanted to implement the, the ACEQ. So that's kind of the background on how this came about to be. And so it was in August that Dr. Siri and I had a first larger team meeting, and she's going to talk to us about that meeting and what came out of that meeting. 
Yeah, so with this meeting, we kind of had two goals. The first, obviously, being implementation of the ACEQ or the Adverse Childhood Events Questionnaire. To introduce another screening tool, as many as you may know, it can be complicated, and we wanted to make sure we brought the right people to the table. So having Vanessa, again, present was extremely helpful. I got to provide kind of a clinical perspective. Uh, Ruth was there explaining how it's not just that we're going to be checking that these things are occurring, but we're going to have next steps available, too, which is massive for us having our clinic manager present, making sure that we weren't putting undue additional burden on our staff, uh, which I'm sure we're all feeling right now. Uh, we needed to also make sure our IT person was involved because this was data we were gonna be collecting and we needed to know where we could store it or pass it on. So as the numbers were generated by a patient, would it get told to the nurse? Would it get put in the electronic medical record or EHR? Um, and then the second step from that, our second goal potentially was, if we collect this data, could we then do research with it and see long-term effects of those numbers? So we brought in a research person as well who could explain to us, well, if you do this with the data, this will be easier for IRB approval versus if you do this. And it was great that we got to hash all of this out at the same time so everyone was on the same page from the get-go. Absolutely. And so coming out of that meeting, there were, like Dr. Siri had mentioned, there were a lot of next steps. So the very first step that uh, we took was joining the National Pediatric Practice Community. So this is a community um, that is a, an initiative of the Center of Youth Wellness. And what this community does is it supports all clinics within the nation who are implementing the ACEQ. So it provides updated resources, it provides a handbook on how to implement the ACEQ, it gives you everything. So I was able to derive a lot of information and have a lot of assistance in rolling out the ACEQ or beginning the, the rolling out process. So it was very nice because it allowed me to take a, a protocol that they had created and adapt it appropriately for our clinical setting. So in this protocol, it has different scripts. It has a script for the front desk staff. So we decided that when our patients come in, um, they will be handed the ACEQ by front desk staff, and they will complete it during while they're waiting in the, in the waiting area. When they're roomed, the rooming staff will just ask them what their total number is and refer that number to the resident physician. So based on that number, the resident has a guideline to follow. So if a patient scores zero to three and has no symptomatology, resident physicians just make the patient and parent aware of symptomatology that they can look for. So for example, focusing on any sleep disturbances or any weight gain or weight loss, just signs to look for that something might be going on. If a patient scores zero to three, and has symptomatology, then that patient will be referred to either behavioral health or community referral. And if a patient scores over three, they will be referred regardless of symptomatology. And that referral process will happen in two different ways. As I mentioned earlier, behavioral health is integrated within the clinic for about 60% coverage. So that's Monday through Friday. So if a behavioral health provider is available for integrated care, the behavioral health provider will be asked to go in and talk to the patient and the parent about the ACE score and about appropriate referrals. So we may have that patient stay within clinic and we may uh, provide the support within clinic. If it's a patient that we feel would be uh, better supported within the community, such as through mentorship or a community provider, community therapist, we will give them that information. So that's kind of where we assess how we can best support those patients. I also created a referral sheet. So I had just mentioned that the patient may be referred out to the community. And so this is a referral sheet for both behavioral health providers to use or the resident physicians. It's very simple, and I'm actually going to show you a description of that in a little bit. And then we've also just completed our project description and our research application in order to collect that data. So we're very excited. It was submitted to the IRB on Monday, and I was told that we'll hear back in a few days. So we're waiting for the outcome on that. 
So this is an example of what the ACE queue looks like. So there are actually three ACE queues. So there is an ACE queue for children 0 to 12 years, and then there is an ACE queue for teens, so 13 to 19 years. So the ACE queue for the child and the ACE queue for the teen are both filled out by parents. However, there is a third ACE queue teen that self-report. So if the teen wanted to self-report or if the clinic decided teens would self-report, then the teen would complete that questionnaire. We decided for our clinic that we would do both forms for the child and the teen having the parent report. And this is, a, this is actually our referral sheet. I wanted to demonstrate how simple it can be. Um, so this is what I created. I wanted it to have uh, a, a nice flow, and I wanted it to be simplistic so that our resident physicians weren't being overwhelmed with referrals and not knowing who to refer to, what's better. So I identified childhood development. And then we talked about mentorship or identified mentorship. So big brothers, big sisters, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. Sometimes it's that you know, supportive activity or mentorship that is most valuable to children. And then we also identified therapeutic services in the community, both sliding fee and then Medicaid and, insur and private insurance based. So lessons learned. We want to talk to you about this process and uh, some of the limitations as well as the future directions that we'll be taking. So we want everyone to know that the ACE queue is not a validated tool at this time. They're in the process on validating it. Uh, but because it's not validated, some clinical leadership may push back on it. Um, I believe because we introduced trauma-informed care in the very beginning and our leadership bought into it that we didn't receive pushback. So that's been exciting. Until we get our IRB approval, IT cannot um, create any specific documentation within the electronic health record. So we're waiting for that approval from IRB. So that's something to keep in mind too, um, that you can't document it in the electronic health record in a particular area without, without IRB approval. We are also limiting the ages that we screen. So we determined that we would screen at age 4, 11, and 16. And there's a few reasons why. Uh, we want, so 4, 11, and 16 are very different times in childhood with different levels of understanding how the world works, different levels of dependence on caregivers, and very different social support systems. These are also times where our patients come in for regular vaccinations. So we thought it would be a great time to screen. And we looked at the numbers, and it looks like we'll be screening about 185 patients per year based on our numbers for those three age groups in year 2016. We also want, I do also want to mention um, the limited avail availability of behavioral health. Like I, met, I had said, uh, we're in the clinic, we're here about 60% of the time for coverage. Um, we'd obviously like 100% coverage. So we're not always there to do that warm handoff for resident physicians to really do a, a bit of a deeper assessment and referral process. Uh, but our residents are well trained and we will actually have a specific training once we implement this questionnaire. Vanessa's gonna come in again spend about two hours with our resident physicians as well as some of the front desk staff and our nursing staff so that they have a solid understanding why we're doing this initiative and what the outcomes are. So as I mentioned before, as we start collecting these numbers, this is Dr. Seary again, uh, we are hoping to trend them over time, both for the population of our clinic and individually for our patients. Uh, ideally, if we're intervening correctly and we're getting services for families and patients that might need them, one would hope, though of course we can't control everything in the outside world, that the number of adverse childhood experiences would hold fairly steady or not rise much. Um, but if we notice that there is an upward trend over time on an individual patient, we may realize this is someone who's at high, high risk uh, for not just depression and anxiety, suicidality, et cetera, but also at a health level. So over time, uh, we have a couple options on kind of how we're going to track this. But I also like 
I, I want to back up just a little bit how, again, this opens the conversation to families and patients to know we care about the fact that these things have happened, but it's up to them if they kind of want to initiate and talk about the specific events that might have occurred in their life. Uh, otherwise, this is their way to tell us something happened. I don't need to rehash it again, but because I know you're my doctor and want to help me be a healthy individual, I'm glad to communicate I may be someone who's at risk. I also want to mention again that there's a lot of people who get upset about initiating another screening tool in their clinic. I think this one will save us a lot of time on the long run. If we have someone who did have an adverse childhood event of some sort, again, you don't want to rehash it over and over again, especially if you're trying to focus on other health aspects in their life. But if you have someone who presents to you who has a very high number on the screening tool, you know, maybe this isn't the day that we spend talking about sunscreen and bug spray and the number of their servings of fruits and vegetables. Maybe we do need to set that aside and focus on more active issues going on in that patient's life. And I think we'll render better care with our resources in this way. If we are able to get IRB approval uh, to study these numbers in the long term, I think, it, again, it would be really nice to also prove the model of having this integrated behavioral health services on site with our patients and the impact that that has. I, am, for one, am very excited as a clinician to have these resources available and the quality that I see people like Dr. Nutting bring in uh, because I see a lot of clinic people hesitate to ask about these things because they don't feel prepared to have follow-up uh, for it or they themselves may be fearful of addressing things that they don't have the power to influence. So I think this is a bridge for those of us who don't have that background and training but know the importance of it. Great, thank you. And so now we're gonna open the floor up to all of you listeners uh, and we're going to answer any questions that you may have for us. Thank you, guys. And yeah, I think I gave the wrong instructions in the beginning related to asking questions. It looks like on the user end, it's the questions tab. So if you do have some questions, you can ask them, I think, through the questions tab. Um, I don't know if you guys have the chat tab. So okay, so there's a question that just popped up. Can you guys see that? No, I don't think we know how to see it on our end. Could you read it to us quickly? Sure, yeah, I'll just read it. Um, uh, okay, well, the question is, are you providing these slides? And I can answer that because the webinars are all recorded and posted on the site, so you can look at those. But if you like slides, I guess they are looking for a copy of the slides and also copy of the ACE Q. Yeah, the ACEQ, um, I would recommend that you request that directly from the Center for Youth Wellness. And all you, they, you go to their website. Um, if you Google Center for Youth Wellness, it's the first thing that's going to come up. And it's perfectly free. They just want to know who's getting it. And so I would recommend that you go to their website. There's a tab, I believe, for professionals or for clinics and just shoot them a note that you want to have access to that and they'll send that to you. And so Kelly Roberts uh, says, thank you for that reply. Uh, now this is Sissy White. Are parents receptive to being asked? Are, and are there any worries about this inf information and the ways it'll be used that discriminate against families? You know, there, there is a lot of controversy about that. And so, Sissy, thank you for that question. Um, typically, and what the research is starting to bear out, is that families do appreciate being asked. Um, because that, as Dr. Siri said, it opens the door for their relationship with their health professional. And they don't mind being asked. And like she said, they don't have to tell what happened. Um, so that particular piece of it, I think we're finding Patients want to know that their health professional cares about more than just sunscreen and bug spray. And so um, I think that we are finding that that's, uh, we haven't been able to implement yet in this clinic, so we can't speak for this clinic, but the research that we're seeing uh, does say that. And I'm sorry, I've lost the second part of that question. 
Sure. The second part is, are there any worries that the information could be used in ways to discriminate against families? Actually, that's one of the reasons why we only report the number, um, because that helps buffer some of that. It also takes away the risk of uh, the health professionals having to report um, because it doesn't matter, as I said earlier, which of those ACEs they've experienced. And so you're not put in a position of being a mandated reporter and having to turn things in when sometimes those in incidences, like Dr. Siri said, are 12 years old and maybe they've already had the intervention and support them that they don't, that they don't need. Um, but I think that's an absolute good thing for us to be paying attention to when we're doing training. And also important that we normalize that experience of having ACEs. And again, that, that ACE study was, was white folks with insurance. Um, and so helping folks understand that the ACEs experience is not unique to race or class. Any of us can have those experiences. It's all about what sort of systems and supports and resiliency factors that we have to mitigate that, uh, that makes that difference and how can the healthcare professional those resiliency factors. And it, it can also be effective where events are a natural disaster and then a divorce of parents and then death of a close caregiver. So again, it, it, I don't think we need to think about just people living in poverty, people exposed to gang violence, et cetera. These are universal human experiences. Another aspect I like about this is I think a parent could also sit there and reflect, what is my number? Do I need to maybe think about what my childhood and other experiences in life have had as an impact on me and do I have impacts that could be affecting my own life and then my children, et cetera, et cetera. So again, it's, it's meant as a conversation starter that the conversation is controlled by the parents and the patient. And I'll selfishly uh, ask a, a follow-up here or perhaps both ask and comment on this because uh, a clinic that I worked at um, a couple of years ago uh, spearheaded screening with the ACE. In our case, it was with the adult population. Uh, but one of the things we ran into was um, uh, not parent or patient resistance, but actually provider resistance, just the discomfort with um, asking these questions um, and sort of that idea of opening the can of worms, even though we had 100% coverage of all open clinic hours with behavioral health. Have you run into or you're preparing for any sort of resistance from providers? I think we are definitely preparing, and I, it's starting really with the education process that we're going to provide for our residents and for our front desk. And, I, and in that, we're going to provide the literature so that they have that understanding. So not only are our resident physicians getting a specific ACEQ training from Vanessa, but like I mentioned, we're taking the next three months for their behavioral health new conferences to address trauma-informed care. So they're going to be getting a large dose of this. And I've really noticed that our residents, if they understand why we're doing something, they will embrace it. Um, they are also very open and accepting of integrated care and um, any assistance or expertise provided by behavioral health. And so I think they'll look forward for another opportunity to collaboratively work together and serve our patients. And I, and because they are just asking that total number and then either getting behavioral health involved or referring to other resources, I, I don't expect them to feel like this is a large burden on them. Do you have anything else to add to that, Vanessa, from any studies that you've read or experienced? Uh, I think you're absolutely right. And truthfully, you know, as I do this work with other clinics, the Via Christi Clinic has been like the easiest organization that I've encountered. Thanks. And you're welcome. <laughs> um, because we do get a lot of pushback from physicians and other providers. Because, and a lot of it is because not that they don't think that the science is there, but they don't feel equipped to respond. And I think that's been the piece that uh, Dr. Nutting and Dr. Siri both have really tried to focus on is 
giving them the information up front and giving them resources to use when the can gets opened and what do we do when we move forward. And that's been a, uh, and it'll be interesting to see what we hear from the residents once we uh, start visiting with them more. And not just the residents, but the front desk staff and how they feel about, because um, when we start training about ACEs, start, folks start doing a lot of self-reflection. And so then we have to manage that as well. But I think you're, uh, Dr. Benetting's absolutely right. It's that pre-prep phase of it that's going to be crucial to that process. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, here's a couple of other questions on the board here. Patrick Palmieri is asking, uh, sorry if I missed this info earlier, but what's the difference between the ACE and the ACE-Q? ACEs are experiences. The ACE-Q is a screening form. and the Cuber ACE questionnaire. Yeah. Q for questionnaire, and the ACE Q, in fact, at, uh, um, do you mind flipping back to Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Um, actually, asks about the original ten experiences that were part of the ACE study, uh, and then it has an additional seven because the folks, uh, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, who's a pediatrician uh, for the Bay Area Clinic in San Francisco, is the one leading this charge, and in that area, as we know in others. There's lots of other trauma, and so they've decided as they're validating this tool, they want to honor the original science, but they also want to look at these additional risk factors. So um, ACEs are the experiences, and then the ACEQ is the instrument to measure that. Great. And uh, another question from Kelly Roberts. Are there any studies or guidance uh, document regarding the possibility that caregivers are gate gatekeeping because they are actually the perpetrators? That's always a risk. Um, and one of the nice things about screening over time is not only is there gatekeeping, but people are embarrassed and they don't want to self-report. And so until the healthcare professional can build that relationship, it's very possible that we're not going to get accurate responses the first time we asked. And so um, we may see a shift in scores just because people feel safer to respond. Um, so yes, that's a risk. Um, but we know that going in and have to take that into account. And if it helps for any, we do follow the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations that starting at age 11, parents are actually asked to step out of the room momentarily. Uh, that allows time for the provider and the child patient to then have some personal interaction and just double check how's life going? Are there concerns that you have? And over time, hopefully, again, that child would realize maybe peeking over their mom's shoulder and seeing the questionnaire getting filled out about them. And they're like, hey, my mom missed these numbers. Oh, really? Do you want to tell me about those things? Do you want me to bring your mom back into the room to talk about those things? Um, and again, it, that could be a whole other conversation about how those kinds of uh, uh, settings are directed. But yeah, definition of um, kind of early adolescence starts with 11, so that's part of why we pick that age. Great. Uh, I'd like to ask another follow-up as well, and I may have missed this also in the set of slides, but uh, one of the things that I also encountered, uh, not just with ACEs, but various screening tools we tried to implement in clinics was the challenge of uh, getting, you know, the getting IT to help, especially if you're planning on putting the scores in the EHR. So, um, yeah, what is the plan for the recording of the number, or is that not going in the EHR? Um, so what we found out was, um, I think we just spoke a little bit earlier, because it's not validated. Sometimes if you're part of a larger health network, the IT doesn't want to put it in there, because they're like, well, if this turns out to be something that's disproven or a different one comes out, we don't want to put all this work in the forefront early. So uh, we meant to say the word validated. But um, with us, uh, it is, yeah, a little more complex on the IT side to create a whole new document that can be universally shared across multiple clinics. So for now, we are planning to have the number recorded within the body of the note uh, that gets passed along again from the patient to the nurse to the um, clinical provider at the time. Uh, when patients are filling out the paper forms, obviously the uh, total number can be recorded there, not circling the individual events, just the total number, as we stressed before. 
what we're hoping is through IRB approval is to collect the papers that have no personal identifying information on them, but we can sort by uh, potentially uh, the young childhood versus middle and late childhood types and can trend that data for the population as a whole. One other thing I think we also, I forgot to mention, was that if we continue to have success with this as a screening tool, regardless of whether we get approval for the study, because we're piloting this with a smaller population or um, number of patients, we would eventually hope to expand it to all ages of patients for well child checks, and then even expand it to our other clinics that we've described where the family medicine residents have their own private patient panels that they serve. Uh, so this is just one step. Those ages are something we came up with for our own reasoning um, and, and aren't specific to the people who created this. So basically at this point, if I understand correctly, you guys are, are using a paper trail right now and then entering that information into a database or spreadsheet on the back end. It's not being done on the front end. Correct. Mm -hmm. On the front end, the physician will put in the total ACE within their notes. Right. Okay. All right. And for those who are curious about the EHR, it's because we have templating that we share amongst ourselves versus the theocracy system as a wider whole. So we can easily create a template that has a space for this that IT doesn't have to sweat about. <laughs> but I'm assuming that within that template, you can't collect data from there. It's just text. Right. IRB said if we collect from that, that's mining individual charts, uh, and that is harder to get IRB approval for. So that was our clever workaround was going back to paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Those are all the questions. Any other questions for our presenters today? All right, doesn't look like there's any questions coming through. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, we certainly, you know, I think one of the great things about these webinars is that uh, there's always a to be continued. And we'd love to hear, um, you know, perhaps sometime in 2018, where, where your pilot has gone and what other lessons learned uh, you have for us. Would you guys be willing to do that for us? Absolutely. I was hoping we'd have the opportunity to follow up with you all in about a year from now. Yeah, yeah. These are great. These are great efforts. Um, really valuable. Um, and the the learning, one way or the other, you always learn a tremendous amount um, engaging in these processes. And uh, hopefully, a lot of patients get helped along the way as well. So thank you very much uh, to the three of you. Thank you for having us. All right, everyone, thank you again for joining us. Um, again, if you don't know about CFHA, you can find out about us at cfha.net, our conference at integratedcareconference.com. Um, and please join us next week. We have a webinar next week, actually, as well. Um, you can check out uh, that information on the website as well. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>